It's 4 p.m. on Tuesday, October 14th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyung. Our top story this afternoon, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un makes a first public appearance in about 40 days quelling rumors about ill health, but he was shown using a cane for support. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang Sung-hee has more. With walking stick firmly in hand, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has reappeared in public for the first time in 40 days. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Tuesday that Kim gave field guidance at a newly built Wisong Scientist residential district. The report did not specify when the visit took place, but added that Kim inspected a newly built Natural Energy Institute on the same day. He was accompanied by Hwang byung and other top officials. Kim's longest absence since coming into power in late 2011 had fueled rampant speculation about his health and even a possible coup. Gout, high blood pressure and diabetes all run in his family. Kim, who had been limping since early July, was last seen on September 3rd at a concert with his wife. But even with his reappearance, many questions remain. During his absence, Kim missed two high-profile public events, the Foundation Day of the North Korean state on September 9th and the anniversary of the establishment of the Workers' Party last Friday. Some analysts say it's odd for the leader to be inspecting new buildings when he failed to show up for two key days in the political calendar. But an official at South Korea's Unification Ministry says that while details are sparse at the moment, Kim may be attempting to sweep away rumors he had been removed from power. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. And staying with North Korea, revisiting its earlier report, the U.S.-based Institute for Science and International Security says North Korea has shut down its 5-megawatt reactor at the Yongbyon nuclear complex. The think tank, however, did also stress that it does not imply the site has been permanently shut down, adding that the reactor is likely to restart and the evidence for that would be the discharge of water from the secondary cooling system. The agency says although it's difficult difficult to pinpoint the exact cause, the North appears to be trying to remove the fuel rods in order to build nuclear bombs. President Park Geun-hye begins a five-day trip to Italy to attend this year's Asia-Europe Meeting Summit in Milan. Also on the agenda is a meeting with Pope Francis and summit talks in Rome. Our presidential office correspondent Choi yoo reports. Just three weeks after her diplomatic debut at the United Nations, President Bakune will attend the 10th summit of the Asia-Europe meeting, better known as ASEM, in Milan, Italy this week. In line with the summit's theme of responsible partnership for sustainable growth and security, the Korean president will talk about her vision for connectivity between Asia and Europe, in particular her campaign to link energy and logistics infrastructure between the two continents. President Park will explain her Eurasia initiative to leaders from Europe and Asia and secure support from SM leaders. It's speculated President Park may talk about North Korean issues at the global summit. On Friday, the president will visit Rome for summit talks with her Italian counterparts and seek stronger cooperation in her envisioned creative economy of converging IT with culture and other sectors. Seoul and Rome will also discuss increasing trade and joint energy projects. Italy, the origin of the Renaissance and a fashion and cultural powerhouse, would be the best partner for Korea's creative economy. Aside from economic relations, President Bak will solidify Italy's support of our North Korea and unification policies. She will also pay a visit to Pope Francis, who made a historic visit to South Korea in August. Her latest visit is expected to bolster two-way relations as Korea and Italy celebrate the 130th anniversary of diplomatic ties this year. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Seoul's southeastern Jamjil area will soon be home to one of Asia's tallest buildings. The new Lotte World Mall finally opened the low-rise part of the complex today, but 
with Chamjil being an already bustling area that has some concern about traffic congestion and safety issues. Kim Min-ji takes a closer look. Becoming a global multi-purpose shopping complex, that's the goal Lotte World Mall will strive to achieve. Korea's largest shopping mall, which comes with a luxury department store, a duty-free store, Asia's largest cinema and an aquarium, opened to the public on Tuesday. With some 1,000 local and global brands included in its lineup, Lotte wants visitors to shop, dine and enjoy entertainment under one roof. But the retail giant still has some major obstacles to clear. The mall was due to open at an earlier date, but this was pushed back due to worries about traffic congestion as well as some serious safety concerns. The district is already a busy residential area with a large theme park, so traffic is expected to worsen with the opening of the mall. In a bid to encourage customers to use public transportation, Lotte plans to build an underground pedestrian plaza in the area that will connect with a nearby subway station. The mall will also adopt a parking reservation system and will only provide a pay parking lot. To address well-documented safety concerns following the appearance of sinkholes and a decline in water level in a nearby lake, Lotte says the mall will undergo regular safety inspections in conjunction with the city government and follow strict management measures. But due to such concerns, some residents are staging protests, demanding the city government withdraw its decision to allow the mall to open. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young, live from Seoul, every weekday, only on Arirang. In a move that's very much likely to cause hot debates in parishes around the world, the Vatican has released a preliminary report. It calls on the Christian community to be more open about gay people, unmarried couples, as well as those who have divorced. Our Son Jung-in has this report. It is being described as a striking shift in tone by the Catholic Church regarding gays and lesbians. Following a week-long closed-door meeting, the Vatican released a preliminary report Monday which showed an unprecedented openness to accepting the relationships of same-sex couples. It said they had gifts and qualities to offer the Christian community. While no doctrinal changes in the Church's condemnation of homosexual acts or gay marriage were proposed, the report said it should recognize the positive aspects of civil unions and couples who cohabit. The document summarizes the ongoing debate between Pope Francis and 200 bishops on traditionally controversial issues such as divorce, birth control and homosexuality. Bishops said although Catholicism does not support same-sex marriage, they must find ways to make gay people feel included. It's language that is less judgmental and more compassionate than previous statements under different popes. Roman Catholic gay rights groups around the world hailed the review, describing it as a breakthrough and a major step forward, while conservatives within the church rejected it, calling it a betrayal of traditional family values. With the basis of the preliminary document, the bishops' assembly is due to continue this week, with the final draft expected to be issued on Saturday. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And on to the latest on the Ebola outbreak. The current situation is being noted as the most severe public health emergency in modern times. The World Health Organization has issued a new warning on the outbreak, saying it could lead to even failed states in uh, some of the world's poorest regions. Here's our Connie Kim with this next story. As far as warnings go, they don't get much starker than this. The World Health Organization says this Ebola outbreak is the most severe acute public health emergency in modern times. A statement delivered on behalf of WHO Director General Margaret Chan said the epidemic could even lead to failed states. She added that the outbreak proves the world is not prepared to respond to any severe health emergency. The death toll from this outbreak surpassed 4,000 last week. But Chan did not mention latest figures, saying instead that the numbers are rising exponentially. With the epidemic seemingly spiraling out of control, London's Heathrow Airport will begin screening for Ebola on Tuesday. 
Around 1,000 people from Ebola-affected nations have arrived in Britain over the last month, and an estimated 85 percent of them entered the country via Heathrow. Through monitoring, British authorities hope to track their movement and quickly isolate a patient if they start developing symptoms. International concerns about the spread of Ebola outside of West Africa peaked earlier this week after a healthcare worker became the first person to contract the virus within the United States. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Police in Hong Kong are taking down new barricades put up by pro-democracy protesters after being battered by anti-occupied groups at the heart of the business district the day before. Demonstrators had hit the pavement, putting up new reinforcements made of bamboo while others poured concrete over existing road blocks. South China Evening Post reports police were removing the barricades in Causeway Bay this morning with power tools and cutters. Now this comes after several hundred people against the protest, including taxi drivers, demanded major thoroughfares be cleared on Monday. And all of this, of course, as activists call for fully democratic elections slated in 2017 in Hong Kong, a demand that the city's chief executive Negative CY Lung says will fall on deaf ears. A major gas deal was signed between Beijing and Moscow on Monday that would enable Russian gas supplies to be exported to China's northeast. Now that will be via the Power of Siberia pipeline, also known as the Eastern Route. The document was signed during a visit by China's Premier Li Keqiang to Moscow together with Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. The agreement will last for 40 years and enable the two countries to cooperate in the spheres of engineering, construction and operation of the gas pipeline infrastructure. On top of that, reports say Russia and China may complete negotiations by next year on building a second pipeline via a western route. Major foreign investment banks think the Korean economy will grow 3.8 percent next year. That's an average from 27 institutions in a recent survey by Bloomberg. The lowest outlook was at 3.2 percent, but some 10 institutions, including Morgan Stanley and Citigroup, projected an expansion of 4 percent or more. Some of those banks cited threats from North Korea and the Japanese, or weakening Japanese yen rather, as downside risks for the Korean economy. The outlook comes after the International Monetary Fund last week downgraded the world's growth forecast for 2015 from 4 percent to 3.8 percent. It's a big day for Korea's newest tech giant, Dam Kakao, as it debuted on the Tech Heavy Cost Act in one piece today. But as our Hwang ji -hye reports, recent privacy scandals have come in the way of the firm's market cap beating earlier forecast. Taum Kakao, born through the merger of a Korean internet portal operator, Taum and messaging application firm Kakao Talk, was listed on the Korean stock exchange on Tuesday. The new tech giant got off to a good start with prices of its new shares on an upward trend. They ended trading at around 130,000 won or roughly 120 U.S. dollars. The entity's market cap reaches over $7 billion, easily surpassing Celtrion, the previous number one on the country's secondary bourse. That, however, still falls short of earlier expectations of $9.5 billion amid recent privacy concerns. Those were spurred by reports that authorities are able to read messages in real time to monitor anti-government remarks. Tam Kakao has apologized, saying it will make privacy its top priority, even when there is a discord between privacy and law. 
We have not been responding to requests from investigators to monitor messages since October 7th, and that will continue. It has also laid out a handful of measures. They include adopting a new privacy mode and saving users' chat records for less than three days, which is down from the current one-week period. But that does not seem to be putting users at ease. They're quickly switching to other messengers like German-based Telegram, which has emerged as one of the most popular apps in the local market. Pundits say recovering the trust of its users will be the key for Tam Kakao moving forward. Huang Jie, Arirang News. In much anticipated news for Apple fans in Korea, the company says its latest smartphones will be hitting the shelves here on October 31st. Apple filed an application last week and won radio wave certificates for its iPhone 6 and 6 Plus on Monday. It will be the first time Apple's smart devices will be sold through all three of the nation's mobile carriers, namely SK Telecom, KT and LG U Plus at the same time. The new iPhone models will also be launched on the same day in 23 other countries. And while Apple gets ready to release the new iPhones in Korea, its rival Samsung may be getting ready to forge a stronger relationship with America's Facebook. Industry sources say Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong will dine with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg this evening at the Samsung headquarters in Seoul. Sources add the two will likely talk about possibly developing smartphones specifically designed for Facebook. Now, this isn't the first time the two have met. They also had dinner together in Seoul in June last year. Corporate social responsibility has long been a virtue of many companies, and our Paul E. reports that a growing number of Korean firms are making a more concerted effort to take this responsibility abroad. Take a look. This is Dream Center, established in Indonesia by Hyundai Motor with the help of the Korea International Cooperation Agency. The facility offers practical lessons on maintenance techniques to young students, which helps them find a job or launch their own businesses. The first Dream Center was set up last year in Ghana, a technical high school for automobiles that was built for local students. Uh, Korea, uh, through Hyundai and uh, Koika, mm -hmm. helping us to uh, make, to develop our country, mm -hmm. to help the, the youth yeah. through this uh, engineering uh, skills acquisition. Mm -hmm. We are happy with that. The group also operates a project called the Happy Move Global Youth Volunteer Program, which has been sending volunteers across the globe every year since its foundation in 2008. Kia Motors Green Light Project provides assistance to African nations, while Samsung's Amazon School in Brazil gives education opportunity to underprivileged kids. In Vietnam, both Hillsong and SK are offering a free medical service clinic for children. To fulfill our responsibility as a global firm, we are making diverse social contributions, not just in Korea but overseas as well. We hope these activities will also help the nation improve its global status. With more local companies developing inroads into international markets, their social contribution activities are expected to continue gathering speed, helping to widen their profit sharing by helping communities in need. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And shifting gears, we witness many different kinds of hybrids around us nowadays, but here's one kind that claims to fend off cancer. Our Shin Zemin has this next story. This vegetable may look normal on the surface, but it's much, much more. It contains components that fight cancer and is the first so-called functional veggie in the world. Developed by a seed expert in Chungcheongbuk-do province after years of study, this produce is a crossbreed of Korean cabbage and turnip and contains an excessive amount of beta-carotene that is associated with reducing the risk of cancer. I used a biotechnology technique called microspore cultivation to fully embrace its characteristics. Park says the vegetable can be grown all year round using regular cultivation methods. It has also been genetically modified to be insect resistant and has strong soil adaptability, so it can even be grown in a small garden. The pace of growth is much faster than other produce. 
and it is fresher and crunchier as we have to gather them daily. The only catch right now is that the seeds are quite pricey. Experts say the cost will come down, however, as farmers begin reaping the profits from their mass production and as more consumers begin reaching for healthier options. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. In cultural news, when an artist is at work, the material they use is obviously very important. But there are some who transform the material itself to an art piece. Our Im Hyun Hee introduces us to some of those artists. It may look like a broken piece of rubble, just scraps left behind. But each piece defines what this artist views as ever adapting contemporary art. So it's something really important in my work that uh, things are not fixed, that they can uh, evolu uh, evaluate and change uh, um, uh, in a way, a, a surprising way. The renovated Atelier Hermes is now home to 16 different works of art. Works that use crystal, silk, leather and silver plating in an avant-garde marriage of technique and material. But sometimes, art is considered a window into one's soul. And that's certainly how artist Yun myung ro feels. Often named one of the greatest masters of contemporary abstract paintings in Korea, Yun captured over 50 years of history on his canvases. You can find traces of the artist within each work, which is why this exhibition is called Traces of the Spirit. An important figure in contemporary Korean art, Ibu takes the viewer to another world through her dramatic use of various materials. Her installation work evokes a sense of the eerie and even the frightening as it billows smoke through the air. Just one way this artist speaks about society today and the hauntings of tomorrow. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. It's another bright day. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. We have clear skies in most parts of the nation, except down south where it's looking very cloudy today. Now, temperature-wise, we started off the day with the chilliest morning of the season. Now, the low dipped to 8.5 degrees here in the capital. However, the sunny day has warmed things up a bit. The current temperature is at 17 degrees and the high is expected to top out at 19, which will fall back down overnight, leading to another cold morning. Now, other regions are feeling the chill as well. There is cold wave alert in effect for some regions in Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces. And for other regions, enjoy the nice sunny afternoon. Now, going over to our temperature readings for today. So will top out at 19 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will see highs up to 21 and 20 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island peaks over to 22, while Tokyo reaches 14 degrees, while Mount Kungang hits over at 16. Well, that's all for Korea. Now here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that's all we have for now. Our next newscast is at 6 p.m. Korea time. Thank you for watching.